Rafi, I just want to congratulate you on a great deal of uh, creativity and innovation in, in, uh, in all three designs. Um, we've talked a lot today, we've heard a lot about community, and one of the things about your designs that, that, uh, that you know, I really thought a lot about was the office building and how that allows for a new sense of community. I do a lot of work with uh, young creative people and trying to provide housing and, and workspaces for young creative people. And there's a real challenge uh, of creative people that can't afford to live in New York today. And what's happening is New York is losing a lot of creative people to places like Berlin or Buffalo or Detroit uh, or Philadelphia. And you know why is that? Berlin, Germany, and Americans, that is. Um, and, you know, there's a real thriving art scene in Berlin and, and all of these places. And, you know, why is that? Is, is, have you been to Buffalo in the wintertime? It's, you know, it's not, it's not the most hospitable place, but it's affordable. And, you know, creative people can afford to go to these places and to, and to do their work and create things. And with that design in particular, there is sort of a community aspect and a very small, um, what we're calling a living space where people really are sleeping and a much larger uh, cr uh, area to create and area to interact with people. Um, and it's really the affordability that I think will sort of allow people to come here. And, and I was wondering if in that scheme, if you had really thought, we're thinking specifically about young people who won't view sharing resources as a hindrance, but actually, actually benefit. Right. You know, that, uh, in a way, that is happening today, right? I mean, people line up at Starbucks to get a table to sit all day and work with other strangers. So it's not something uncommon to New York. I mean, uh, being, being creative in New York, any, any second person is creative. He lives in the city, right? So it's not, uh, it's not such, such far-fetched. I think the affordability, definitely. I mean, the idea of creating more space in an existing envelope, just refitting. We talked about this kind of, but I think that it was mentioned before, the abundance of space that exists. It's just a question of how to distribute it, right? Uh, I was so intrigued with what I'd say, the range of buildability schemes here, to, mm -hmm. to quote from the earlier session. And uh, maybe beginning with the, uh, the Whitestone prototype, uh, that really uh, so artful in using the uh, symbolic form of the community, the roof, to define a very different new pattern of, of living re uh, relationships. In that particular design, you anticipated um, all of the different households actually being part of a single family unit. Could you anticipate, mm -hmm. and, and this really goes to probably all of the questions I'll ask, any of the social challenges in that particular context of having a variety of different types of households, or does your design really anticipate uh, just an extended household as, as the end user group? Well, it's, it's not an overarching, it's not to suggest that all of Queens becomes this kind of prototype. It's just to say that within the single family uh, pattern, which is existing today, there is room for extended families or three generation families. So by introducing those in a mix, you're already kind of mixing with the existing. So it's not one in place of the other. I, th I think what's so interesting is that probably is the utilization of many homes in that yeah. and other Queens neighborhoods yeah. with extended families and particularly in immigrant communities. Um, and by designing a much better utilization mm -hmm. of the lot, yeah. um, you're, you're creating a whole different set of housing choices. Um, could you tell me more, maybe leaping from uh, the Queens example to the Inwood example, whether, again, in terms of the relationship of people using the space, what was your thinking as far as whether that's entirely self-organized or curated in some way, even at Starbucks around the table or someone managing the space? Right, right. I mean, there is a, a, lot, a lot to figure out still how this would work. <laughs> yeah, maybe Jesse, you want to yeah. say something there? Um, I'll just add something to speak to the inward example. Obviously, there's a big question of of ownership and accountability for the space. And so I think the management of the building becomes as important as the kind of creation of the, mm. of the system itself. So obviously there has to be a kind of strong management presence that allocates different units to the different places that are shared and maintains a kind of you know, zip car system for using something like the, the yeah. shared computer space or the entertainment space. But I think um, this, the idea of having this very informal pattern 
organized around quite a, a formal structure was very much prevalent in our thinking. So you have these four cores and they organize how you arrive at your apartment and that would be the same kind of system that would organize how you shared these different kind of amenities within, within the space. But yeah, it's a really strong question when it comes to these shared amenities which are so valuable yeah. and so add so much value to a home that they do need this kind of strong yeah. sense of ownership and accountability. Yeah, I, I, one, you know, in the larger kind of uh, framework, we can ask the question, uh, in our society today, or do cities, or where, or do cities need an aspect of self-organization? Because we see that all over. We call it informal settlements, etc. And the question is, yes, but the question is where, on what scale that happens. So we can easily imagine a component of self-organization in the scheme, but still other parts, well, the infrastructural parts that allow you to, to inhabit these living floors, that those are designed, pre-designed and kind of managed. Um, I've been really struck by the sort of enormous creativity that's gone into not just your project, but some of the others that we've seen today. And it, and it all seems to focus on the same problem, that, that we're in this um, kind of post-nuclear family age where there's a multiplicity of family compositions and single people and so on. And um, a building stock, a, a city that's already very dense and not a whole lot of room to move. Um, so I thought particularly interesting the, the office conversion, the idea that it doesn't have to be the entire building, you can convert part of it. Your kind of urban kibbutz uh, built on top of a parking garage and so on. Uh, sort of fascinating solutions. Uh, but I wonder, you know, can we get Matthew to build one? Because I think um, the problem with a lot of the um, office conversions that have happened in downtown Manhattan, which have gone over to that work living uh, model, uh, they've been very uh, costly and very high-end and haven't really drilled down into the more affordable sector. So I wonder what you feel. I mean, you probably haven't gone as far as costing these things, but that would be the next yeah. challenge to yeah. do them affordably. Yeah, we can, uh, yeah, this is just the beginning, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we, uh, you, you know, the, we talked a lot about this code that doesn't allow uh, uh, multiple programs on a single floor. Yeah, right? but Bob Lamandry is going to solve that later on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could address that a little bit too because I would like to build them. Uh, the, the answer is in some cases absolutely and that's because if you think about if I was going to take a building today in Brooklyn or Manhattan that's going to be a residential building and I could do anything I wanted with it and it's a rental building and I didn't have to worry about any codes at all. What I would design is something with a lot of very small uh, individual dwelling units and a shared common space. And the reason is that I'm going to get more dollars per square foot for a building like that because people are going to pay in some cases to actually be a part of that community. And so if you give someone a room of 200 square feet and then they're sharing common area, well if you're a 23 year old and you're moving to the city for the first time from somewhere in the Midwest and you don't know anyone, not only do you probably not have a lot of money to, you know, to afford something larger, but you may also not know anyone. So you actually are happy to come into a situation where you're living in a communal environment. And if, you know, I've done the math on this and the dollars per square foot that we can get in rent for designing and building something like that, the economics are more favorable than if we actually have to abide by the codes and do what the code allows us of traditional, say, one and two bedroom apartments and, and studios. I gather that in all three schemes that all would meet um, current fire safety regulations, structural codes, and uh, uh, standard light and air provisions, and that the, um, the gap uh, as far as their buildability is around contextual zoning, uh, parking requirements, and uh, uh, certain provisions on mixed use. Could you elaborate about well, what's between us and that right. set no, of but realities? Also, also what, what the kind of defines a family, what defines a household, is a unit without a kitchen a unit, is it without a shower considering a unit, without a toilet, you know, so. How, how many, how many uh, 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 current zoning uh, uh, practices and regulations would the Whitestone House violate? Uh, we, Could we, you articulate we, that? We, we, <laughs> we, we stopped counting. 
I mean, I hesitate to answer this categorically, but I can attempt to. But uh, the overall lot coverage, the backyard setback, and the definition of the household are the three main things that we're contributing in this case. Um, and all three of which we feel like the, the design that we've proposed is something that offers a very favorable and positive reason for doing all of those things. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that I thought was particularly appealing about a couple of your projects was the idea of adaptive reuse. I mean, uh, it's so much more sustainable than knocking the, knocking the building down and building something new to take something that exists, adapt it, and uh, reuse it, repurpose it the way you did. Yeah. No, I, I, that's really important because that was one of uh, kind of the ideas to show that you could think of different architectures within within the existing, and not uh, and and things do not need to be automatically kind of erased and and built new. Back to the question of affordability, the for the Queens project, did you think about this as potentially a modular project? And are these in? I think the real question here of affordability is developing a model that's scalable that can be reproduced, uh, you know, widely. Could this be potentially uh, a new model of the the Levitt houses, for instance, but of uh, but of a modular nature? You know, I think that the the existing house is already modular. I mean, the the type of roof, uh, you know, basically it's all modulated, and you you can buy and build in Home Depot. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the elements are the same. It's just the form and the relation between what is designed and what is left uh, kind of open, in a way. So if we're designing a roof, uh, and the way that the roof operates, collects water, collects energy, etc., but the roof is that element of design, whatever happens under it is more flexible. And, you know, part you could do yourself, part could be uh, kind of pre-designed by, by an architect. But it's really also, I think in all the schemes, it's not about minimizing space, it's about actually providing more space, and it's uh, about where design can stop, where the architect kind of does not need to get into the uh, every detail, let's say. It's more about strategies, and where we can stop designing and allow people also to, it's their home, so they, they, uh, they want to, to input some of their own into it, into it. And, and you see it everywhere. So it's a question of can architecture find, find the way to live with that and, and, uh, and find the place for that as well. We're out of time, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we can carry on the conversation at lunch, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.